Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I've been back to working on my HF transmitter project and I've got the IF section working. Let's check it out. Let's pick right up from the ending of episode number five. I left off with showing that the balance modulator was working properly and was generating the minus 20 dBm double sideband suppressed carrier signal that I needed. So next up on the signal flow path is the IF section. As a quick refresher, I'm giving the signal a little boost in the first IF amplifier, then feed it through the first bandpass filter to chop off the unwanted sideband, and lastly boost it up to the minus 10 dBm level that I need to mix it with the VFO signal. Here's the schematic diagram for that IF section. Now I went through it in detail back in episode 2, so only a few highlights to talk about here. The block in the middle is that junk box crystal filter that I evaluated in earlier episodes. On either side of it are trimmer capacitors that I'll use to optimize the filter input and output impedance matches to the surrounding circuit. This design is pretty much identical to figure 6.103 from EMRFD, and according to the figure notes, those two trimmers might not even be necessary depending on the filter you use. So I'll start with 20 to 60 picofarad units and connect my scope to these two test points and adjust the trimmers for maximum signal throughput. If the peak happens to occur at minimum setting, I'll swap them out for still smaller range units or remove them entirely if they're not of any measurable benefit. And here's the finished IF section. I did the usual method of fabbing and hand populating my own board and it was pretty easy. The board's not that much bigger than the filter. I did that deliberately to keep the overall size small and the signal path short. Let's connect it up to the preceding circuitry and try it out. Okay, here we go in the lab. Most of this should look pretty familiar by now. Got the usual test equipment over here that I've got configured. I've got everything now from the two-tone audio signal generator, the audio amplifier, the double balanced uh, modulator, and of course the new IF stage and a new very simple dummy load that I put together for this project so I don't have to use that large 300 watt uh, capacity dummy load. And what I'll do, uh, similar to some of the other videos, I'm gonna re set up the camera so we can get a closer look at just the scope screen as I go through this and test out and see am I getting the output power that my calculations showed that I should. So here we go. What I'm showing on screen right now, that's the output of the audio stage, which is also the input to the double balance modulator. And if you recall from the prior episode, uh, the value I'm looking for here is 250 millivolts peak or 500 millivolts peak to peak. That's what a level of signal I want for my test, and I'm still spot on. I'm at a tenth of a, a volt per division, and I've got five divisions there, so that looks good. That's channel two. Now, channel one, that's the output of the IF stage uh, connected across that dummy load I was just describing. So for that, what I need to do to look at it, I need to switch to channel one, and I need to switch the trigger to channel one. And I also need to turn on the signal on the signal generator. So here we go. I got to set that to plus 10 dBm to drive it. And there's our output. Now let me try to increase the or decrease the time here so we can take a closer look at it. Here we go. So that is the output of the IF stage. Now this is also a 10 times probe, so it's 50 millivolts actually. The probe I'm using is, a not, is not an auto-select. This is a genuine Tektronix probe, so it auto-selects. This one does not. So that's 50 millivolts. So I'm looking at about 100 millivolts peak or 200 millivolts peak to peak. And if you do the math um, with a 50 ohm load, that works out to be just about minus 10 dBm. So that's looking good. The other observation I would make, and I think I'm doing this correctly, this is a single sideband signal that is at the target frequency of 5.5 megahertz plus the roughly 1.8 kilohertz, I think it was, audio frequency signal. If it is single sideband, then it's really just going to be a sine wave at that sum of those frequencies, and that sure is what that looks like. All right, so a couple quick items to talk about here before I move on in the episode. The first, I do want to touch on the trimmer caps that would be here and here. And you can see, at least here, 
Um, that one's missing. That's C5 and C7 is also missing. So as I mentioned early on in this episode, I uh, was going to adjust those to, to maximize the signal throughput through the filter. As it turns out, I dialed them down to minimum and I kept getting stronger and stronger signal. I swapped them out for uh, units that would go down to two picofarads, so basically almost zero, and the signal kept getting stronger and stronger, so this took them out. So as the uh, article in EMRFD mentioned, they may not be necessary depending upon, uh, depending upon which filter you have, and as it turns out, this guy didn't need them, so I took them out. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about here before moving on is I did off-camera optimize RV1. So that is the uh, trimmer pot that's in the second half of the IF amp, and what I did with the input set to the 250 millivolts peak, I just adjusted that to get to the minus 10 dBm output. And as it turns out, there is plenty of headroom in the second half of that IF amp. I could turn this up quite a bit more all the way to, I think it was minus 5 dBm before I just started to see uh, distortion and nonlinearity in that output signal. So that's good to know that this amp has plenty of headroom. So that's great that the IF chain is working correctly. And ordinarily, I'd be talking about the second mixer next, but I'm actually going to take a step back and take another look at the RF preamp that I covered in a prior episode. I got a different idea of something I want to try there. I decided to take another stab at the preamp. Going back to episode number three in this series, I left off with choosing this design. Three stages using a 2N3904, a 2N2222, and ending in an IRF510 MOSFET. I solved my gain compression concern from the original design, but I had created a new issue. The gain is now dependent on frequency. It drops off considerably from 7 MHz to 28 MHz. That's mostly because of the lack of feedback in the MOSFET circuit and the gain limitations of using the IRF510 at progressively higher frequencies. So I'm revisiting yet again using an RF-capable BJT as the third element in the amp instead of a MOSFET, and that means dragging the venerable 2N3866 or 2N5109 out of retirement. Yeah, I said those are obsolete and getting harder to find even from new old stock, but I did manage to find some 2N5109s on eBay that claim to be Motorola Originals, and for the asking price I couldn't resist giving them a shot. So here's the new design. It's based on a single stage 2N5109 amplifier schematic by SV1AFN, although I have made some modifications to the output transformer and to the bias and feedback resistors to dial it into what I want. Running it through LT Spice, I get these gain compression curves versus frequency, which fit nicely to my updated target of plus 27 dBm output with minus 15 dBm input before hitting significant gain compression and the gain is much flatter over frequency as compared to the IRF510 design. I do want to thank SV1AFN for that design. That helped me solve that problem I was having of not being able to get enough power output with a BJT before hitting gain compression. So thanks very much for sharing that online. It leads into a natural question at this point, which one of those two RF preamps am I going to build? Well, let me say this. I'm going to paraphrase a quote from one of my favorite sci-fi movies, Contact. Why build one when you can build two at twice the price? So, yeah, I'm going to build them both, check them out, run some tests, and see when, which one I ultimately like, and then make a decision. I've also made a few adjustments to the architecture of the transmitter, so let's take a look at the original block diagram. I was planning to carry over the relay switched filter approach that I used on my receiver project. That approach did work well on that receiver and gave me three band capability. However, the transmitter needs that bandpass filter section and an additional low pass filter section right here after the final power amplifier. That doubles the relay count to at least eight, four in the bandpass filter block and another four in the low pass filter block and two MAX 4820s to control them, and the time and complexity of laying out all that hardware. Add in the cost of the parts, and I decided that was just too much. So I've punted on that approach and simplified it to just a single socket for one bandpass filter and a single socket for one low pass filter. That greatly simplifies the design and greatly reduces the amount of work I have remaining. Of course, changing bands now requires having to open up the unit and swap out those two filters, but I've got ideas for how that'll work, and I'll go through that another time. I'll still preserve the auto-detect feature I had on the bandpass filters, so that the Arduino will automatically recognize the filter and set the correct VFO frequencies on power-up. 
The next topic I want to talk about in this episode is the case I'm planning to use for this project, and here it is. And it should look familiar. This is the case that I bought off Amazon for the receiver project, but then realized it was just way too big. It's 100 millimeters by 205 by 250, and it's, I think, a very good appropriate size for this transmitter. Now, the circuits I've shown so far are pretty small, but I got some big things I'm going to have to package, not the least of which is going to be the final power amplifier board and a boost converter for that uh, final PA because I need 28 volts. I'm going to have to boost it uh, from 12 volts to 28 volts to run it, which leads into another topic. I'm going to have some heat to get rid of, and I just so happen to have this heat sink that I salvaged off of a $5 ham fest uh, special that I got earlier this year. It was a, a noise meter of some kind, and I don't even remember what it, uh, brand it was, but nonetheless had a lot of good parts in it, including this, this heat sink. And this is going to fit nicely right here on the back panel. I've built this 3D model of the case and I've started populating it with the various internal parts and the controls and connectors. For starters, I'm going to upgrade to a larger TFT display. The HF receiver uses a 1.8 inch display. This time I'm going to use a 2.8 inch display. That larger size is a better proportional match to this case. I'm also going with a minimalist interface, which should work just fine because a transmitter needs fewer user controls than a receiver, and as I said in the first episode, I'm designing this transmitter to be remotely controllable from my HF receiver. So on the front panel, there's only the display, a single rotary encoder, a microphone jack, and a microphone gain pot with an integrated on-off switch. The back will have the heatsink I mentioned earlier, along with a 12 volt DC power jack, a UHF antenna connector, a BNC connector to route the antenna to the HF receiver when in receive mode, a serial connection to the HF receiver, and a jack for a CW key. Another nifty feature that I'm going to try here is to connect a pair of tilt switches to the Arduino so that it can detect which of the four possible X or Y directions is vertical. Then the Arduino will rotate the display accordingly so that it's always right side up and readable. That way I can position the unit however I wish. I've designed these feet that will protect my table from being scratched by the aluminum case and it also hides the screws on the panels. I'll 3D print four of them. Back to the tilt switches. Connecting them to the Arduino would be trivial if I had two digital inputs, but I don't. I've only got a single analog input left, so I've devised this resistor voltage ladder scheme to provide different voltages for each of the four unique orientations. I tried to get at least a half a volt difference between each of the four orientations, and you'd think that would be easy, but it's not. I sketched up a few different schematics of resistor voltage dividers and played around with the values, and finally settled on this one. Now for sure, there's more than one way to do this, but this approach will work just fine. So that's all for today's episode. As always, I hope you're enjoying this series that I'm putting together on this HF transmitter. I'm probably the, the millionth person to ever build a homebrew transmitter, but it's a lot of fun to try out uh, mixing some of this older technology with newer techniques and getting it to work. Looking ahead at what I'll be doing next, I have a lot of parallel paths I could take here. I could work on some of the mechanical side of it and start packaging some of the finished boards that I have already and get them into the case. Uh, I'm definitely wanting to build that mixer and that preamp, or actually both those preamps, and, and, and try them out and continue getting the entire chain to work. I've started working on some of the software already. I got some ideas of what I'm going to do for the coding, and of course I'm working on the graphics for the display. So we'll see what I decide to, to work on next. So until next time, bye for now.